Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, I'm glad you are joining me tonight. I'm sure we're going to have more people shortly as people are filing in. Seems so strange to say filing in when it's online, but hey, whatever works, right? Now, if you could type in the chat that you could he can hear me, then we can get started. So just say hello in the chat. And then I will pull up the PowerPoint and we will begin the presentation. I've got a lot of really great information for you. Um, this was a very interesting topic. It filled in some holes that, of things that I've been thinking about. Um, so it's, it's really quite interesting. Okay, so we got Norma Jean and Carolyn, Michelle, Judith, Catherine, another Catherine. Um, sorry, maybe that's the same Catherine. I'm reading things twice. <laughs> Teria, Leticia, Carol, Michelle can hear me perfectly. Thank you so much, everyone. All right, let's get started. I'm just going to pull up the PowerPoint. And here we go. And we'll just go to view and reading view. There we go. Okay, so now we're full screen. All right. So we're going to be talking about obesity and the connection they've made to microbes and what the microbes are doing for us or to us. And as I said, it's quite an interesting topic. So I think you're going to find hopefully some pieces that maybe make sense to you as well. Okay, so um, healthy foods that support the gut seem to be only reaching a certain segment of the population. We live in a bubble and we probably think a lot of people are eating certain foods that we know are good for the gut. And certainly they have grown like fermented foods and things like that. They've grown in the, the amount that people purchase them. Um, you know, you used to not hardly be able to get any, now you get a lot, but it's still pretty much in the health food world. And there's an entire segment of the population that is constantly eating foods that don't support the gut. And of course, these same foods have been linked to obesity. As a result, the obesity rate is 39% in the US and 18.3% in Canada. Now, of course, I know you know this, but it puts a strain on healthcare dollars and resources as obesity is linked to other health issues such as heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. And, you know, we talk a lot about sort of the approach that is taken by government and uh, the medical profession in terms of dealing with situations like this. It's, it's, you know, they see the healthcare costs going up and, you know, they link it to, you know, different factors, one of which is obesity. And then so they, they try to sort of, you know, manage obesity like there isn't something else going on. And we talk about that a lot, that really there's more of how the body functions is more the point than what people are actually doing. And so you're gonna see that a bit tonight when we talk about this information. Now, in terms of weight loss, even today, most calorie uh, weight loss programs are calorie in and calorie out, which is shocking to me. You know, I've been a holistic nutritionist for 22 years, 23 years, actually, well, coming up to 23 years. And um, I haven't thought of it as calorie in, calorie out for quite some time. I guess, do I think there are people who overeat? Of course there are. But I also have met and worked with people who don't overeat and they can't lose weight. So uh, it's kind of shocking that this is just, you know, the same situation we've always seen. And it doesn't matter how they kind of dress it up. Um, I'm sure you've seen the advertisements for Noom. So I joined Noom for about two hours because <laughs> I wanted to see what it was all about. And it is just a dressed up version of calorie in and calorie out. Yes, they do have some information they pass along that'll be about, you know, food habits and things like that. Um, but really they kind of just are telling you, you know, these are the foods you should eat and you should eat so much of these foods, right? And they're giving sort of a serving size, kind of like a Weight Watchers in a way, the way Weight Watchers does it. 
Um, so most of these plans do consist of healthier foods for people, and most of the people who go on them have been eating a more standard refined diet. And of course they lose weight, uh, but then they gain it back. And that statistic hasn't changed at all. It's about 5% of people who lose weight maintain it. And so that's, you know, I don't know what your definition of failure is, but if the, you know, you can't base the success on what happens while they're trying to lose weight, you really need to come back five years later and see how they're doing. So I'm sure many of you have heard of the set point theory. Um, it's, a, it's a theory I do not like, and I never liked it. It's from many years ago. And it basically states that your body fights to maintain its current weight. So if you lose weight, your body will fight to get back to its set point, which is where you were before. So this is what they came up with. I mean, talking years ago, uh, years and years ago, maybe I don't know if it was the 80s or the early 90s. It doesn't really matter. It's basically saying you're doomed. Um, and it is just a theory. They didn't find any switch in the body that makes this happen or any gene or any anything. It's just, just a theory. Um, and that was based on the observation of people regaining their weight. And they didn't consider things like low functioning metabolism, which really does exist because I've worked with women like this, especially women who have been dieting a lot. Um, it's not as bad now where most weight loss programs that are considered any good are around 1400 calories a day. But if you go back to the sixties and the seventies and even the eighties, um, it was under a thousand calories per day and somewhere under 500 calories a day. And you're basically slowing down the metabolism because you're starving, right? You're not giving the body enough fuel to keep its metabolism running well. And so when you get into a situation like that, the metabolism slows down and people go back to eating and they gain weight very quickly because, you know, they're eating normal portions and their body isn't used to that anymore. So this is um, some of the stuff that we're dealing with, but we don't hear about stuff like that. And when they came up with the set point theory, they didn't even think about that being the reason that maybe some people are regaining their weight. So it also kind of counters the thought process of people trying to lose weight. They think their body is just a product of what they eat and the exercise they do not do. Um, and the weight programs basically support this concept. And there's a little talk that the person's body just may be different and may not support thinness. So what I have been thinking about is if the set point was really about microbes. It's, it's not, there is no set point, but there may be microbes that can explain this, what has been observed for years. And, you know, we haven't done well by our microbes. If you go back to, uh, you know, the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, uh, and, and even now, depending on who you're talking about, we really don't feed the microbes well. So new research um, is indicating that the reason for the regaining is about microbial composition. And in mouse studies, researchers have identified what they're calling an intestinal microbiome signature that persists after weight loss. So basically this is speeding up the weight regain and any other metabolic aberrations that may be playing. I guess the microbial composition for thinness. All right, so what are microbial signatures? This refers to the composition of strains in a given area. And researchers are looking at signatures as a way of developing a predictive model for health conditions. They've already identified some in cancer cells, so this isn't just to do with weight. And, and you know, what they're trying to do is some kind of uh, predictive nature where they can look at people's gut bacteria and say, oh, you are in a higher risk category for whatever condition based on whatever the microbes are there, whatever different strains there are. Probably humans, are, it's going to be too difficult to do this, um, especially for obesity, because there are other factors. 
but it is something that they have been looking at, at least in the mouse studies, to sort of try to predict why people gain their weight back. Um, and obese microbial signatures in mice are changed with diets that feed the microbes needed for leanness. So when they give these mice food that they have identified will help promote microbes that are for leanness, they um, change the signature. So this is good news. And we also know that in humans, you can change microbial composition. So it's not something we can't do as well. Um, it just may not be as easy as it is with a mouse where you can control so much of what they're exposed to and what they eat. Now, there's two scenarios that set a person up for regaining the weight. The one is that the weight loss plan did not include foods that could change the signature. So again, a lot of weight loss plans uh, can get very cutesy and they eliminate a bunch of different foods and tell you not to eat this and not to eat that. And nine times out of 10, what they're telling you not to eat um, has a lot of prebiotic foods. Um, or uh, maybe the diet plan had aided changing the signature, but the person went back to eating the type of foods they ate previously. So if you're working with someone who has lost weight and regained it and they're, they're you know, confused, one of the things you want to talk to them about is what they ate before they tried to lose weight, what they were eating, like specific foods while they were on the weight loss program, and then what they did when they got off of it. So you don't want them, if they did change the signature, switching it back to where it was. All right, so here are some other microbe connections to weight issues. And some of these are more in keeping with what you probably know to be true uh, already. It's just, you might not have thought of it as the microbes playing the role as to how this plays out. So microbes affect how we store fat. Uh, they affect how we balance blood sugar and adrenal function. They, uh, how they, you know, help us respond to hormones that regulate appetite. So in other words, they're regulating your appetite. They affect our ability to modulate stress and you know how stress can cause weight gain around the middle, uh, helps with liver function. You know that uh, some people, it's a sluggish liver that may be impairing some of their ability to lose weight. Now this can be because of the glucose situation. It can be of the thyroid situation because the liver plays a big role in both of those and regulating them. Um, and it helps the thyroid function. This is the microbes again. And it helps with metabolism. So you've got microbes, specific strains of microbes that are helping to um, figure out how your metabolism should function and dictating how that's going to turn out for you. Of course, microbes also affect digestion, nutrient use, and elimination of waste. So um, these are all areas that we are aware of, and we know that um, they all have to function properly for someone to have a well-functioning metabolism, utilize their foods well, etc. All right, some more gut connection. So they did a study of twin mice, so a whole bunch of twin mice. And they found that when they transferred gut bacteria from lean mice into obese mice, it allowed them to lose weight. The mice that did not receive the thin bacteria had a less diverse gut community of bacteria uh, because they, even though they were eating the same food as the regular mice. Now, this is a very interesting piece of information because from our perspective and what we know about diversity of gut microbes, it requires the diversity of the diet. And so to um, be able to uh, help people eat different foods is always something we've, we've strived for. But in this case, now I don't know what these mice were eating. I doubt it was a diverse diet. It's always mouse chow. And then they manipulate the mouse chow some way, but it's not what you would call diverse. But in this case, what they're saying is that the thin mice had a more diverse bacteria from the same food as those who weren't thin. So that's a very interesting piece of information. 
Um, and one theory suggests that obese mice are missing strains that help with thinness. So it doesn't matter what they're eating, they don't have the strains. They don't know whether this is true yet, but based on the way they have gone back and forth with of having, you know, lean mice get obese mice bacteria and getting fat, and then uh, obese mice getting thin bacteria and losing weight. Um, it's pretty, pretty, at least in mice, interesting uh, information. Other mouse studies have found a similar relationship with fat storage as well. And an abundance of firmicutes, so firmicutes are a family of bacteria, clostridium strains are in this family, lactobacillus strains are in there, provitella, um, a lot of really well-known bacteria uh, families are in the firmicutes category. Um, but they, in the, in the abundance of firmicute in morbid obesity is positively correlated with better conversion of white fat by brown fat, which is uh, necessary for weight loss. So when you have more firmicutes being created in the mice who are overweight, it helps with their con conversion of white fat for energy, which is what you want. Uh, microbes also play a role for thermogenesis and basically thermogenesis is uh, stimulating the brown fat to convert more white fat to energy. And there's something called non-shivering -shiver thermogenesis, which encourages brown fat to convert, convert the white fat to energy, but it's been linked to cold. So the colder you are, uh, the more you stimulate the non-shivering thermogenesis, which in turn stimulates the brown fat to convert the white fat to energy. Now, Cold exposure changes microbial composition. So you end up with more firmicutes when you're cold. And I want you to think about not just us personally, because we're a little messed up right now. We don't experience the change in the seasons the way we would have many years ago because of central heating. And um, they've even coined a term called cold microbiota. So these are the microbes that are changed in the microbial composition, you get more of this, this, these microbes that are suitable for cold, um, of course, increasing the white uh, fat burning, it also increases energy, fat loss and insulin sensitivity. And the mice were in the one study I was reading, it was 12 degrees Celsius or 54 degrees Fahrenheit, which is a bit chilly. However, there have been, I wrote about this several years ago because there were studies on this talking about non-shivering thermogenesis. And in one study, they just had, it was on women and they had them lower the temperature uh, in the house by about six degrees to go from 78 to 72 Fahrenheit, which is way too hot for me, but apparently people do have their homes that warm. And the, they saw weight loss in the humans in this study. So this is a, applicable to us. It also makes sense that when we think about seasonal changes and, you know, in the past we would gain weight to see us through the winter and then we lose it towards the, the spring. It was the cold that increased the firmicutes that increased the fat loss through the winter, which is kind of interesting. I know you're all gonna go sit in your refrigerator now if you have one big enough. <laughs> Um, most studies have shown that diversity and richness of the gut microbiome are reduced in obese subjects. And looking at clients' current diet and starting to increase the prebiotics in the, their diet is the best place to start, even before you put them on any kind of constructive plan. Uh, variety in food, of course, is tricky. And it's important to note that when we talk about diversity of diet, because if you say that to most people, it's hard. It's very difficult to try to increase the amount of different types of food you're eating every week. Um, and, you know, try to keep it organized in your mind and, you know, sort of, you know, constantly thinking about it and whatever. It's, it's stressful. But think about it more seasonally because the microbes change seasonally 
So that's what the diversity should be. There should be certain foods in the winter, certain foods in the spring, certain ones in the summer, and certain ones in the fall, and, and then make that as diverse amongst those types of foods as possible. So remember, as I was saying, that seasonal eating was designed for weight gain in the fall and weight loss by spring. But the microbes are preparing for the weight loss by the spring in the winter. So heavy carbohydrate meals of winter improve ability to lose weight by spring. And yes, there was a study. It was a human study. They did find that this is what helped people lose weight throughout the winter and they measured their gut bacteria and saw and observed that the microbial composition changed as they did this. So let me ask you guys a question and you can type in the chat. How many of you have salads and smoothies in the winter? Just, just type in the chat. I know what the answer is for most of you. I'm pretty sure. I know what the answer is for me. How many of you have salads and smoothies? Darius says some. Jennifer says yes. Salads, yes. Smoothies, no. Yes, not in this house, says Jennifer. No smoothies, only salad. Salad. Okay. And you probably think you're doing well by having salads, right? You probably think that's a really thing, good thing to do. Well, it's not, <laughs> not in the winter. Um, I mean, we really have to rethink the way we reward certain types of recipes for their, uh, you know, benefits. Uh, we need to pay attention to what time of year it is and what we're actually doing. I, I'm, I'm, you know, I've made some connections about smoothies in my own personal life, you know, because I was doing the morning smoothie thing. I'd stopped doing salads um, after I read this article about the winter foods. So I, I don't have salads unless I'm at somebody's house for dinner and they make me. Um, and I don't think it's all that bad when the salad is with a meal with a lot of other, you know, heavier, denser carbohydrates in the meal, like potatoes and whatever. Um, but still, um, uh, you know, I like to eat salads in the summer. That's when I feel like a salad. Smoothies are a whole other subject altogether, which I won't go into, but, um, the fact that we don't chew them is becoming more of an issue and something we should talk about it on some other time. Okay. So again, if you said yes, I bet you have those salads and or smoothies all year long. That's what most of us do. We eat, we might have a, a few things that come in in the summer that we don't eat in the winter. And we may have a few things that come in in the winter that we don't eat in the summer, but there's a lot of basics that are in our diet every single day. Um, and so what I'm suggesting is that for diversity and for changing microbial composition throughout the year, this may not be the best plan. All right, so I'm just going to go over the Firmicutes versus Bacteroidetes because uh, uh, I'm trying to share, because I read so much about obesity and weight loss and stuff that was related to uh, microbes, and there was confusion, let's put it that way. So uh, a lot of times you'll read articles that say, oh, well, if you know you want to lose weight, you need more Bacteroidetes than Firmicutes. But I've found studies that show higher firmicutes to bacteroidetes ratio is present in overweight subjects. But I found other studies that show less firmicutes to bacteroidetes ratio in people who are overweight. So in other words, it doesn't seem to have a rhyme or reason. And it's because these uh, categories are so huge in terms of the amount of different strains that are present in it. You can't really make any conclusions about them, period. And uh, But you will read this. So this is why I wanted to point it out to you. I wanted you to be aware of it. You know, unless they're talking more specific strains, um, it's really not going to yield a lot of information. Now, some of the studies also included the actinobacteria family, which is, of course, got the bifidus in it. 
um, and then looked at the ratios between the three. Again, all of them are too large and it's too, too many different things could be playing a role in terms of strains information and what affect the strains that it's not really valuable information, but you're gonna hear it talked about it. So that's why I wanted to mention it. Um, and of course they can't agree on what foods do what. So I read an article or sorry, research study about firmicutes being increased uh, through carbohydrates um, that was actually very helpful for people not regaining their weight. Uh, I read other articles that talked about no carbs feed bacteroidetes and fats feed firmicutes. So again, there's no consistency with this and, and I really don't, and again, a lot of it's based on mice. So <laughs> they can feed them whatever they like. And I don't think that's accurate either. All right. So one of the problems when they do all this stuff is they're not considering seasonal eating. So it could be that if they, the study's in the winter time and you naturally have more firmicutes and you're gaining weight because it's a natural thing to do, it could that could explain it. We don't know. Uh, they never talk about the quality of foods. They don't consider what they are actually eating in terms of what's in them. The phytonutrients are a big story. The fiber is a big story when it comes to microbes and to um, factors for obesity. So uh, they don't consider that. And I think we should be past the carbs versus fats versus protein stage because it's just not helpful. All right. I also wanted to find out about visceral fat and what the research showed. And it found that visceral fat is more connected to gut micro composition than subcutaneous fat, which makes perfect sense since we know visceral fat is, uh, for example, is more likely to occur due to adrenal stress. And um, we know there's a gut micro, uh, comp uh, my gut microbe connection to uh, adrenal stress. Uh, subcutaneous fat is something we're supposed to have. We're just not supposed to have too much of it, but we're supposed to have it. Um, so this could be due to the relationship between the gut microbes and how they interact with nutrients. And it could also be due to the gut microbe composition itself. There wasn't a lot of clarity on that, just this observation that uh, it, seems to, it seems to occur more um, with gut microbe manipulation than subcutaneous fat does. Now, of course, the good news is modifying the diet can alter composition. So this is something we can do something about. I also wanted to look at short chain fatty acids and obesity. And it's a mixed bag. So there's levels of short chain fatty acids in the colon are about 20% higher in those with obesity. Butyrate, is considered protective against obesity and it helps reduce food intake. Butyrate levels are affected also by the quantity of butyrate producing bacteria and the pH level of the colon. Propionate can reach the liver and can be converted to glucose. It seems to be protective against obesity, although some research indicates it can also promote it. Acetate reaches the liver and can produce cholesterol. It seems to promote obesity, but it has some properties that protect against weight gain. So we don't really have any usable information here. And it may, this is again acetate, may act against weight gain by working with the hypothalamus to produce GABA. So there is some research that, I won't even say it's research more, it's conversation that is linking GABA to weight loss. But since GABA lowers anxiety, this could be an adrenal stress situation. Okay, so uh, just for the record, butyrate is primarily produced by firmicutes and acetate and propionate are mainly produced by bacteroidetes. But of course it is more complicated than this. Bifidus bacteria, I love this stuff, by the way. This is the kind of stuff I'd love. Bifidus bacteria produces acetate, which feeds other strains to produce butyrate. So again, if you read a lot of articles and they're talking about the production of butyrate, they talk about bifidus bacteria doing it. But technically, it's not doing it. It's producing the acetate, which then feeds the strains that are producing uh, butyrate, like roseburia, I know, is one. 
So we have a lot of this going on where one uh, set of or type of, of strain produces something that seeds other strains to produce something else. Again, making it very complicated. And this kind of cross feeding is going on all the time. All right, what about the thyroid and microbes? Believe it or not, in the 1950s, there was a term thyrogastric syndrome, and it described the thyroid gut connection. So in other words, the connection between the thyroid and the gut has been known since the 1950s. And of course, was anything done about it? Nope. Did they do more research? Nope. It's only in recent years that the thyroid has been getting a look and the gut's been getting a look and the connection between the two. Now, microbes influence the uptake of iodine, zinc, selenium, copper, iron, and they have a relationship as to how we use our vitamin D. So these are all linked to proper thyroid function. And microbes can also influence absorption and utilization of thyroid medications. So maybe you have a client who's on thyroid medication and it's not working very well. It could be the microbes. Now, in terms of the gut itself, um, there are two elements to consider. The way the gut bacteria helps regulate proper function. So there are microbes that help our thyroid function the way it's supposed to function. And the way dysbiosis and pathogenic bacteria messes things up. So if a client has a thyroid issue, you're probably going to be looking at dysbiosis in some form and what be, might be messing up this connection. Now, the word dysbiosis should be clarified because there's different levels of dysbiosis. And so some people might not, they might have a little bit of dysbiosis, but it's not messing up their thyroid because it's not the strains that A, affect the thyroid, number one. And number two, they might not have enough dysbiosis for it to be an issue. And this is true for anything that is related to dysbiosis. Okay, um, now other connections between the gut and the thyroid, well, T4 and T3 protect the mucosal lining and helps prevent ulcers in the lining and the stomach lining. And in return, it helps regulate tight junctions. And of course, gut bacteria converts to T4 to T3 by producing an enzyme called intestinal sulfatase. Dysbiosis lowers the amount of intestinal sulfatase, mainly by taking the sulfur and using it for the, the strains, pathogenic strains, taking it, uh, the sulfur for themselves and not having it available uh, by the bacteria that would produce the intestinal sulfatase. And it's one of the reasons why people with low thyroid function might test normal because their thyroid is working just fine, but this conversion to T3 is not happening properly. Uh, primary bile acids from the gallbladder are converted to secondary bile acids in the gut, and these make the key enzyme, I hate pronouncing this, but I'm going to give it my best try, idothyromine diiodinase, that <laughs> converts T4 to T3 elsewhere in the body. So again, another gut connection for all the conversion of T3 to 4 to T3. Uh, of course, um, the gut also regulates the liver function, and we know liver has a role in, in T4 to T3 uh, connection as well. Uh, and of course, the gut has a major role with adrenal function, and we know that excess cortisol can uh, suppress thyroid function. And of course, um, uh, thyroid function, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought here. Um, dysbiosis encourages cortisol levels. So in other words, when you have dysbiosis, it will raise cortisol levels and this can put stress on the thyroid. You can also have a situation where excess cortisol encourages dysbiosis as well. So those two kind of feed off each other. Uh, what about dysbiosis and LPS? So LPS, which is lipopolysaccharide, is produced by uh, different strains of bacteria. Uh, most people 
uh, will say it's bad bacteria. I certainly said that for many years, but I've read a few things that say that it's not necessarily bad bacteria. And I've also read some things that all LPS is not the same. So that I don't, again, I, we'll have to wait for clarity on that. But what we do know is that LPS gets into different parts of the body. It goes from the gut into the bloodstream through the open gap junctions and uh, makes its way to wherever it's going. Um, they find it with people with liver issues. They find LPS in the brain for people with autism, Parkinson's, um, uh, Alzheimer's. They also find it in joints for people with arthritis, the heart area, like they're finding it all over the place, bottom line. So it is linked to many health conditions. Um, and one of the things that it does is reduce thyroid hormone levels, which of course could be playing a role in obesity. It also dulls thyroid hormone receptor sites, again, which will affect thyroid function. It can also increase the amount of inactive T3, which is also known as reverse T3. It can decrease TSH and it can promote autoimmune thyroid disease. So that's a lot of things it can do just to the thyroid. And of course, LPS increases inflammation, which increases cortisol, which in turn increases inactive T3. All right, so that gives you sort of an overview of all the things that microbes can do that can play a role in obesity. But one of the things that was interesting to me was the discussion of cravings and how and what we eat and the microbes and what they're doing. I'm not sure you're gonna like this or not, but bottom line, it's not you, it's them. <laughs> you suffer from cravings. So uh, this is a direct quote from one of the research articles that um, I have in the references. Microbes manipulate host eating behavior to increase their fitness, sometimes at the expense of the host fitness. And it does this in two ways. Number one is generate food cravings for what foods they need to eat or foods that inhibit their competitors. And two, create feelings of unhappiness and lack of satisfaction in us until we eat what they want us to eat. How does that make you feel? Type in the chat. Do you like that one? Do you like... Uh, um, uh, yes, Julie, I did say butyrate acts against weight gain. Um, do you like the idea that, you know, your mind isn't yours? <laughs> that you're not in control? <laughs> yeah, that's right, Margaret. Who's the boss? I don't think it's us. Um, you, I'm not done yet. There's more. <laughs> Um, it does make sense, Cecilia, uh, you know, again, you don't hear it talked a lot about, but it has to be something going on uh, that we don't know. Uh, Darius says, the devil made me do it, literally. But again, we, we got to think of it not necessarily in those terms that it's good versus bad, but just microbial composition. So change the microbial composition, you change the messaging for what you need to eat, right? Okay, so how do they do all this? Well, first of all, they can alter taste receptors. They can increase, for example, the amount of sweet taste receptors you have in your mouth and your GI tract, uh, or sour or bitter, but uh, um, you know, for most people, cravings tend to be on the sweet side, so that would probably be the one that's most interesting. They can change reward and satiety pathways. And this one uh, was actually quite interesting to me personally. So I'm gonna hope I can say this correctly and not confuse people. All right, so you eat the foods that you eat, whatever they are. And maybe you don't eat certain foods very often you will have less microbes for the foods you don't eat very often than the foods that you eat all the time. And therefore the messaging from the microbes is for you to eat the foods you eat all the time because they're the microbes that want that food because they're the ones that get fed by that food. Does that make sense so far? 
Okay. So I have this situation in my life where um, when I eat rice, brown rice, white rice too, but it's even worse, but brown rice, I can eat a proper full meal and I'm not satisfied. I'm still hungry. I had it today, tonight, just an hour ago. I'm looking forward to my snack when I get off this, this, this uh, webinar because I'm not satisfied. Doesn't happen when I eat wheat-based pasta, wheat-based bread, or potatoes. But it happens with quinoa, it happens with rice, which, and again, these are things I do not eat often. Rice I probably eat more than any other things other than wheat or potatoes, uh, but I may do it at best once a week, but mostly it's like once a month or once every two months. And so it occurred to me when I was reading this that perhaps the reason I'm not satisfied is because the microbes in me, there's not enough of them that are looking for rice and there's a whole whack of them that are looking for wheat and spelt and einkorn because these are my go-tos. I don't even eat oats very often. So I'm trying a little experiment where I'm forcing myself because I don't really like rice that much. I don't dislike it. I don't find it unpleasant. I'm going to eat rice <laughs> every day for the next, I'm going to try anyway, at least five times a week. I'll, I'll try at least five times a week. Um, and see if my, and I have to do it for several weeks because if you don't, you don't change microbial composition. And I'm gonna see if I end up finding a way to be more satisfied and feel like I've eaten enough when uh, I eat rice, the way I do when I eat wheat. And so this one really hit home for me. I don't know if that'll hit home for you, but a lot of us are like that. We just don't eat. You know, why don't I eat oats? Like, I like oats. I mean, I don't crave oats. I don't say, hmm, I'd love a bowl of oatmeal, but if you put one in front of me, I don't mind it. I do like granola. <laughs> I like oatmeal cookies. <laughs> I like oats in my crisp or crumble topping. Uh, I like those oats. But um, yeah, so again, I didn't think about it, right? I was too busy trying to get diversity from vegetables, which I would always have said it was my weakness, and a fruit. And I shouldn't have, I should have been thinking about the grains, and I wasn't. And don't even get me started on legumes, because I don't eat enough legumes either. All right, so other things that the microbes can do is produce toxins that can alter mood. They can hijack the vagus nerve. So as you know, that the vagus nerve is one of the main gut-brain connections. And when you block the vagus nerve, it causes weight loss. And when you overstimulate the vagus nerve, it's been linked to overeating. And then microbes can produce what are called adrenergic neurochemicals like, for example, noradrenaline would be one that contribute to overeating using the vagus nerve. That's a lot of power for a bunch of microbes. So eating only a few foods is going to increase cravings for those foods. Change, uh, changing the cravings requires changing the microbial composition. So changing the diet, increasing the diversity, and adding probiotic and prebiotic foods changes microbial composition and changes eating behavior. Your biggest problem, though, and it's always the problem I've run into, is when you're having conversations, especially with people who don't necessarily eat, you know, a lot of junk food and stuff like that, and they think they're eating well, they really have a problem understanding that the healthy eating that they think they're doing isn't diverse enough. They, they think it's good enough, right? And um, it's really hard to get them to see things in a different light. Um, now, of course, the more diversity, the less microbes will compete, lowering the risk of one group dominating, lowers the risk of microbes being able to manipulate the host. So again, there's a compelling reason. And this, I think you can explain to clients. I think they'll get it. 
because um, if they've had have cravings, they know what it's like and they might be looking for answers for that. Now, I'm sure you're wondering where probiotics fit into this and what kind of research for weight loss has been going on. There's tons of research for it. So, um, and they show that different strains help with weight loss. And this is just an example of one study. It was a, probi mix, a probiotic mixture of uh, L. acidophilus rhamnosus paracasei, Pediococcus pentasasias, uh, B. lactis, and B. brev, that's bifidus lactis. Um, and they found that it significantly reduces BMI and internal liver fat in patients with non alcoholic fatty liver disease after 12 weeks. So there's tons of different studies like that. Uh, looking at different strains, combining different strains. I know uh, there's already a couple of products on the market uh, where they're touting it for weight loss, but I know that there will be more. This is obviously a, such a, you know, logical way they are going to try to use probiotic research to create products. By the way, liver fat was more associated with the complications of obesity, so heart disease, diabetes, cancer, you know, kidney disease, then visceral fat, which I thought was very interesting. All right, so let's look at the role of food because this is where you want to sort of maybe consider what kind of foods are being recommended. So researchers found that flavonoid levels were lower in mice and that this contributed to fat gain, uh, fat, faster regain of weight after dieting. And the question is whether the mice did not have the right amount of microbes to metabolize the flavonoids or there were not enough in the diet before and during weight loss. So flavonoids are part of a large group of phytochemicals known as polyphenols. And polyphenols fall into two categories, flavonoids and non-flavonoids. Both categories have shown that consuming them both long-term or in an acute circumstance can have beneficial effects on weight management as well as heart disease, obesity, type 2 diabetes, cancer, and brain function. Uh, this picture right here is of black cherry tomatoes. I want some. Those look absolutely gorgeous and delicious. And I've had enough heritage variety uh, tomatoes, you know, like farm fresh, not the kind that are old and mealy that you find in the health food store in the winter, but ones that are actually grown in the summer and actually tastes really good. They all have amazing flavor. Um, now, of course, you probably know that your polyphenol family is cocoa, wine, coffee, tea, legumes, grains, vegetables, fruits, especially if they're dark red, blues, uh, purple, or black. And resveratrol, found in red wine, improves glucose metabolism. And that is from human studies and multiple ones, I might add. And of course, resveratrol has a connection to microbes and how the glucose metabolism is regulated. So again, uh, just more interesting information. Now, there are two specific flavonoids that have been identified. Um, apigenin, which prevented weight gain in mice when fed a high fat diet after weight loss, and naringenin, which increased thermogenesis and activated brown fat. And this, of course, was based on animal studies, so it's not as easy to take that information and translate it to, um, you know, what we might be recommending. Uh, but they found that both of these flavonoids were low in mice after weight loss. And then when they supplemented with them, uh, both of them, after weight loss, it prevented weight gain. You're probably thinking, well, where can I get a supplement for those? Again, we don't want to do that. We want to try and have a more well-rounded diet. So we're feeding lots of different types of microbes and including the ones that need apigenin and naringenin. Uh, these are the foods that have apigenin. Again, um, some of them are very common like chamomile, grapefruit, you know, oranges, celery, parsley, cilantro, beer, tomatoes, red wine. And then you've got some that are a little different. Um, you know, would they, would they help? I don't know. Uh, if you just did some vervain or some horsetail uh, along with some of these foods, don't know. Uh, naringenin is citrus fruits again, almonds, pistachios, and red wine again. I can just see some of you cracking open a bottle of wine now. <laughs> You've learned that it has so many benefits. 
It does. And, and I know that there's some study out there about uh, red wine being a carcinogen. I read the study. It's not conclusive of, in any way, shape, or form. All right, another type of foods that are helpful are inulin-type fructans. So they've been shown to help with weight loss, obesity, diabetes, and lipids. And these were based on 33 randomized controlled human studies. So we like that. And human studies found that the inulin-type fructans change microbial composition in 125 adults with obesity and helped alter their appetite. So very useful. Uh, onions, charlots, shallots, sorry, <laughs> garlic, um, grains and such as wheat and barley, cabbage, broccoli, pistachio, artichoke, and chicory root, asparagus, beetroots, beans, and legumes are all good sources of inulin-type fructans. In other words, high FODMAP foods. So again, what are we doing when we're pulling out all these FODMAP foods uh, for people? Uh, is it necessary? Or maybe at best they have a problem with one of the foods. We should not be pulling out all of them. They have other benefits. And then, of course, there's resistant starch. So these are starches that resist digestion and are broken down by gut microbes. Now, it's very important to understand that resistant starch is starch. Okay, it's just a type of starch in the starch part of the carbohydrate that isn't broken down in the small intestines and makes its way to the colon. So even white flour has resistant starch. Potatoes, you know, for years they talk about potatoes, you want the skin for the fiber. Resistant starch is in the actual potato. Um, and so uh, again, I'm just telling you that because that might be helpful information. Um, what it, one of the things that does is help promote gut satiety peptides. So in other words, helping with the feeling of satisfaction after uh, eating. It preserves lean muscle mass and lowers fat storage, increases the thermic effect of food, and but it's not going to translate to weight loss if resistant starch alone is the strategy. Uh, and of course, it's found in grains, primarily legumes, potatoes, bananas, small amounts in fruits and vegetables. But again, you have to have the specific microbes to uh, utilize the resistant starch in the colon to get the benefits. So what does this all mean? The microbe relationship to obesity is very strain specific. There are quite a few strains that have shown a relationship. And it makes it difficult for researchers to be conclusive. Uh, research on areas that we know affect weight might be a better place to start. So what can you do? I would do the gut work first. So if somebody came to me and they wanted weight loss as one of their health concerns, I would put them on an antimicrobial and probiotics and start working on seeing what prebiotics I could get into the diet and possibly fermented foods, assuming that they tolerate them, which most people do. Um, you could be working on changing the microbial signature before structuring the weight loss plan, and it could help make it more effective for them. Now, this would be especially true for those who overeat, because they may need some help and have a need a whole, uh, an actual plan to sort of understand their portions better, etc. Um, I wouldn't have them necessarily measuring things, but I would be trying to teach them how to assess how much should be on a plate for their needs. Um, and then of course you can explain to clients why this may help their goals so that they understand why you're doing this gut work first. Now, of course, once you get the plan going and even beforehand, you want to make sure that the foods contain polyphenols and other phytochemicals that support lean microbes like the apigenin and the naringenin. And of course, you want to have more inulin type fructans and resistant starch foods. So I would try to start working on those. Look at their current diet. See how many of those they're already eating. What new ones can you add? How do they add them? How often? You know, these are all conversations that you can have. Uh, you want to eat for seasonal diversity. So again, you could create a list of foods that they would focus on in fall versus ones they would focus on in winter, spring, etc. Uh, you want more water foods in summer, moving towards 
uh, richer grounding foods in the later fall, consume more starchy dense carbohydrates during winter, and do a combination of the starchy dense carbs and light carb foods in the spring. Again, it's all about variety. And it's a lot easier to have variety when you think of it from a seasonal perspective than trying to jam it all into a week. You know, every week trying to get all this diversity, you're going to get confused after a while and it's not, it isn't fun. But it's a lot easier to say, okay, fall's coming, what's available? Okay, I'm going to try and start getting more turnips into me and, you know, whatever else is available in fall. Uh, after having, you know, the wonderful tomatoes and berries and, you know, corn that's available in the summer. And, you know, there's all kinds of great foods available in the summer that, you know, aren't available necessarily, the good quality stuff anyway, in the fall. And the other thing you want to do is help them listen to the desires of the body, because if you can help them do that, then it's going to be more helpful to them. Now, there are strains that you can support. So Archimensia immunocephala is one that has been linked to weight loss. Um, it is supposed to be stimulated with intermittent fasting, but again, that's not conclusive. But GOS, galacto oligosaccharides in dairy and legumes helps it. So does FOS in grains, bananas, and tomatoes. It's in other foods too. There's a lot of foods with FOS in it. And there's another one that's just been starting to be talked about called xalo oligosaccharides, which is found in honey, fruits, and vegetables. Um, when it comes to probiotics, look for these strains. So if you want to sort of help with the adrenal connection to weight, uh, Lactobacillus helvetica, Bifidobacterium longum, and Lactobacillus rhamnosus have been helpful for lowering stress. And for weight loss, Lactobacillus paracasei, plantarum, and rhamnosus, as well as Bifidus lactis and Brev. And again, don't get too hung up on strains. Don't think of them as the magic bullet. They're not. But again, if you have to pick a probiotic, you might as well pick some with these strains in them. And those are fairly common ones. The sooner people accept the gut holds the answer for their health goals, the better they will be. And it may be time to start teaching them about phytonutrients instead of macro and micronutrients. Uh, most people are well aware of vitamins, minerals, fats, proteins, carbs, but they really don't get phytonutrients. And I think it's time they did. Um, it may be more compelling for people to understand the foods they should be choosing, and it may mean something to them. All right, so that is the end of my presentation. And I am going to come back to you. All right. Okay. How do you shut down the vagus nerve? That I don't know. Uh, <laughs> they didn't say how you shut it down. Um, most of the articles I read talk about stimulating it. So Sherry says, I bought some blueberry cherry tomatoes from Dr. Adam's garden. Can't wait to try them. Sounds delicious. Uh, Julie says, you're providing a slide and list of your references. If you go to the digestersdilemma.com, I'm gonna put it in the chat. I can see my keyboard, which I can't. It's too dark in here. Digestersdilemma.com. Uh, and go to the right-hand side of the, the home page. You'll see the Inspired Learning Hub replays. Just click on that. You'll see uh, the, this particular webinar there, click on it. The re references and the slides are sitting there waiting for you, along with a quiz if you need this for CEUs. So yes. Um, let's see. Oh, Beverly says research studies have cut the vagus nerve in the animal studies. Yeah, we don't want to do that. That would be not very good. All right, any other questions? So I'm really hoping, you know, I, I present this information um, and I sometimes think that, can we get past how we've been brainwashed to think about this topic? Because we really have. We've had such a narrow focus as to what obesity is all about 
when really it's much more complex than we knew. Okay, Ashley is asking, is there a vegan probiotic you could recommend or are most of the ones you name safe for vegans? Um, those are strains. And what you will have to find is a vegan probiotic that would have those strains in them. So, um, for example, uh, Renew Life has human strains and plant strains and dairy strains in their formulas. So if you found a vegan probiotic, they would have sourced the L plantarum from the, a vegetable source and the L rhamnosus and stuff like that. So these different strains are available in nature as plants and is, of course, in animals as well and, of course, in humans. Um, Sherry saying vagus nerve damage, diabetes, concussion, likely much more. I'm not sure what that's referring to, Sherry. Um, Margaret says, great information and a very good indicator that we have been overtaken by microbes. They are in control. I think they always, always were. We just didn't know that. I don't feel so lonely now. <laughs> Knowing that these these guys are with me everywhere I go, I got somebody uh, to keep me company. Um, any additional benefits from fermented veggies? Oh, absolutely. So a fermented food of any kind, whether it's fermented dairy, fermented vegetables, it doesn't really matter. Even fruits, to a certain degree, which of course always have the alcohol, but um, they are both prebiotic and probiotic. So in order for the probiotic strains to develop in the fermented food, they had to feed off of the food that had the prebiotics. So cabbage has lots of prebiotics in it, sauerkraut, they fed off it, but they don't haven't finished it off. There's still plenty there when you eat it. So you're getting prebiotic and probiotics. Um, Okay, genuine health is great for vegans. The links on the website aren't lurk working for practitioners or the free startup guide. I don't know what. You, oh, are you talking about in the banner? Is that in the banner? Yeah, this what I'm talking about is on the right hand column. I have to fix those banners. But um, yeah, just scroll down. You'll find the the link for this webinar. Um, in the Inspired Learning Hub, there's a little ad that says replays. Julie says, can you put the website up again? I clicked on it and got kicked off the website. The digesters. I have to say it out loud in order to spell it correctly. Lemma.com. There we go. Um, Margaret says, we have 100 trillion friends hanging out in our gut. Yep. Wish they would, you know tell us more about what they think about us and what we should be doing. Um, Beverly says, going to pick my inulin rich asparagus for supper now. <laughs> okay, have a good time. Um, Sherry says, what simple info, info and uh, lesson would you suggest to start a cl client off learning about the importance of the gut microbiome? Well, um, you know, Sherry, this is Sherry. This is the Sherry, I think it is, right, Sherry? This is Sherry Mowbray, is it? Is it you, Sherry? Um, if you have the Healthy Gut Program, then you've got that lovely ebook, Understanding uh, Gut Health, that you could give them to read. That's a good place to start. But the reason I present this information the way I do is to try and give you pieces that might excite people when you're trying to explain it. So I, this is why I, Scarborough and Hans, yes. Um, uh, this is why I was so excited about the cravings information because that's so real to people. It's like, if, if that doesn't help them understand, I don't know what would because they can directly relate that to their own lives. So uh, I, that's how I would pick it. I would, you know, based on talking to the person and what their concerns are and what they're afraid of or what they're trying to, or what they think, I would pick the information that is going to mean something to them and start there. Um, Carrie says, I'm battling SIBO and have a hard time with diversity 
do you teach about SIBO in your program? Yes. Uh, to me, SIBO, dysbiosis, candidiasis, and SIFO all have the same basic um, protocol if you take the food removal out of the picture. But the overall need to heal the um, intestinal system is the same. You have to inhibit the, bad, uh, the bacteria you don't want and promote the bacteria you do want. The difference is, is again, you have to be sure that you actually are sensitive to all the foods that maybe are being suggested you remove. So step one is to do some kind of trial and error and get back as many of those foods as you can. And then the second thing is to do is the antimicrobial and the probiotics and some gut lining stuff, some mucus lining stuff, all of these things to build the intestines up. And that usually will take care of the problem. It's not a quick fix, but then uh, from what I've seen from a lot of SIBO people, they don't get fixed anyway, doing whatever it is they're doing. So, um, Margaret says, it is perfect as I had someone tell me that they always crave sweets and it's never stopped. So the coverage of this particular strains was very helpful as this could help her quell the cravings. Again, and you have a, you have a new reason. Remember that uh, microbes mess with our emotions too. Like they really, really are connected to us in every way you could possibly imagine. So, all right. Uh, what do you recommend for reducing the side effects of F? <laughs> What's F? Side effect of F. I think you didn't finish the word, Cecilia. of toxins from candida and other bacteria die off. Okay, so what I recommend is whatever product you are using to inhibit, and that's the right word, not kill, inhibit uh, either the candida strains or the pathogenic bacteria strains or whatever, you start with a low amount, very slow, you go very, very slow, and then up it, until you get to the amount that is recommended on the package of whatever you're using. Assuming that they can tolerate the max amount, then you leave them there until they're finished or you back it off a bit to the level that they can tolerate. That is how I've done it. I've done it so often with people. Sometimes they don't even have any detox symptoms at all. And they complain because I told them they were going to get some and they didn't get any. So they think it's not working. Thank God they have other symptoms that can be measured to, to show their progress because <laughs> I prepare people well for detox reactions. But anyway, but that's what I do. Very slow. Um, how do we get the recording in this webinar? Forgive me if you said it before. Uh, I am sending the replay out tonight and it will be posted uh, I'm going to send it out via email, but it'll also be posted on the same page on the Digester's Dilemma in the Inspired Learning Hub, where the PDFs and the references and the quiz are. Uh, Dr. William Day's new book, Super Gut, he explains that certain species colonize the upper GI tract to produce bacteriocin, so the good guys will kill off the bad guys, in other words. He mentioned l gasryl b coagulants. Yeah, I mean, you're going to get a lot of this information as it comes out. Problem is, it doesn't tell the whole story, and it never does because it's so complex. Margaret says, thank you for doing this. You're amazing. Oh, thank you, Margaret. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending. I hope you got something from this. And as I said, I'll be sending out the replay and it'll also be on the page with the other information. So you'll have everything and I'm going to send it out in a few hours. I just have to wait for this to download and then I will send it out. Okay. Thank you everyone for attending. I really appreciate it.